Hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of Interop Talk. I'm Dave Castle, Chief Customer Officer at Health Gorilla and former Executive Director of Cure Quality. I'm joined by my colleague and congratulations, new grandpa, uh, Dr. Stephen Lane, Chief Medical Officer at Health Gorilla and former Director of Clinical Informatics and Interoperability at Sutter Health. Uh, also here to round out our regular crew are Devin McGraw, Data Sharing Lead at Invite and former Deputy Director for Health Information Privacy at HHS, and Jennifer Blumenthal, Director of Product One Record at Milliman and Telescript. Welcome, everyone, and, and thanks, as always. Um, as you can see, uh, we are back on Zoom after meeting in person last month at HIMSS, which was a lot of fun. Uh, as we, we are looking at the coverage post HIMSS and thinking back on the conference, uh, we, it is apparent that AI was a big topic there, and it's something that we, we glossed over, I think, a little bit in, in our uh, in-person session at HIMSS. Uh, so thinking that we can can delve into that a little bit to kick off today's uh, session. So what are we thinking about artificial and augmented intelligence in in healthcare, and and how might it play specifically into uh, our world of of interoperability in particular? Uh, is there just a bunch of hype? Uh, are we afraid of it? Uh, excited about it? What do what do folks think? I mean, I'm happy to jump in, you know, as, as a clinician, I think AI, you know, has the promise to really change healthcare dramatically. And I think we're already seeing that, you know, early applications, of course, in supporting diagnostics, you know, with, with imaging AI, you were, we're now seeing the, these large language model AI bots being put to work to address a lot of the challenges of burden for both patients and clinical staff. Um, so I think, uh, and over time, I think we're going to eventually start to see AI sneaking in to support uh, clinical decision making uh, more so, you know, really trying to help us identify patterns in individuals' uh, cases and in populations to, to see where we can provide greater value. So, I mean, I, I think we're, we are seeing the evolution of what is going to be a revolution in healthcare. How that interfaces with our whole interoperability world, I think, is really interesting um, and something that that we we should dive into because obviously AI models work on data, you know, and they work on historical data. So the more historical data you have, the more likely it is that an AI you know model will be able to glean useful information. But we are a long way, I think, from seeing uh, this fully impact care. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be very exciting. Well, and and you raise an interesting point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just jump right in right away and 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 stop anybody else from talking. But uh, interested in in particular in what folks think about the the policy implications, which often impact us in in the health IT interoperability world, and in particular as as we we've talked about many times. Uh, the the current national interoperability networks and frameworks tends to be limited to the HIPAA definition of treatment in, in terms of of what is permitted for for the reason for a, a request for information. What do you do when treatment is being provided by an algorithm? Uh, is is there is that something that HIPAA has really contemplated? Uh, I, I don't, I, Devin, I know that. Sure. This is completely out of the blue, and I didn't prep you on that at all. But any any thoughts on that? Well, people have this tendency, I think, to think, well, if software is what's accessing data, that somehow the privacy rules don't account for that. And frankly, the privacy rules don't care if it's a human or a machine. If it's access to something that is defined as PHI, it needs to follow the HIPAA rules. So if you've got you know, a piece of software that assists in treatment recommendations. I'm not sure how much software is necessarily going to want to take take on doing the actual diagnostic because that will surely kick you into FDA approval required land as opposed to mm -hmm. assisting a medical professional with making an independent decision around a treatment recommendation. There, to, you know, the FDA looks at that in two mm -hmm. very different ways. Um, at either in either scenario, 
if the purpose for the access to the data is to treat a population, treat an individual patient, it's treatment, even if maybe the initial step of that is that it gets fed into a piece of software for the purpose of making treatment recommendations. Now that might not fit. I'm suddenly now, Dave, going back to many conversations that we had when you were still at Curry Quality on Run, what constitutes treatment and what doesn't constitute treatment and the production of treatment resources versus the actual decision-making by an individual, there could be policies that might narrow that beyond what HIPAA allows. But certainly mm -hmm. for the HIPAA definition of treatment, it accommodates software. Same thing with you know, analytics around care coordination, analytics around public health. The fact that the data is initially or even solely exposed to a machine doesn't mean that it's not covered by HIPAA. We will still examine, is that data PHI? What's the purpose for which it's being accessed, used, or disclosed? Does it fit with one of the permissions? If it doesn't, you need the patient's authorization in order to do that. So in a, in a lot of ways, our existing legal frameworks, which impact decisions, you can't discriminate against patients, like all of that stuff doesn't go away just because we've used software to either assist us or to actually be making those decisions. Well, Devin, talking. can I just ask you, so when, when I've gone back recently and, and read through some of the HIPAA language, you know, the, the definition that all the treatment definitions all refer to it being done by a clinician or a provider, I forget which term they use. Um, are we saying that the AI can stand in the shoes of and be functioning as a clinician, even though it's not a human being? Well, here's another thing. Do the HIPAA rules not apply to staff? In a clinical office, right? If 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 you have a, a clerical person who opens up a record in advance of a patient visit and prepares things for you, is she violating HIPAA because she's not a clinician looking at that data? No, she is part of your office. And so it really doesn't treat, you know, it may be framed in terms of clinical treatment and clinicians and professionals, but we presume that professionals act not as a solo human individual, but with people and software and tech and all sorts of things around them. And, and so absolutely to read the HIPAA rules as, they don't, as though they don't apply when it's not a clinician using or acting on that data would be, would be a way too narrow reading. Makes sense. You said something and I wish we could rewind because I don't even know how well you said it, but you were giving two examples of like, Oh, I don't even know. It was so good. And you said something and I wanted to go back to it. I'm sorry. I, I talked for too long and it made the it made your, your point go right out of your head. Sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I'll have to we'll we'll just pencil that in for the next podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. But, but and, and that was that was helpful. I think, you know, to your point about the FDA, Devin, you know, we we've We've had some innovative companies that have approached us at Health Gorilla, just trying to explore with us what what their potential would be for for participating in uh, the, the the current uh, interoperability efforts, as well as as in in the the, the Tufka going forward. And you know, I've somewhat unilaterally and, and arbitrarily have said, well, I think it's reasonable if you're algorithm is actually FDA approved as software as a medical device, then it seems to me that even if that's not explicitly addressed in HIPAA, we can reasonably state that a, a request for information uh, at least arguably would meet the, the HIPAA definition of treatment, even if the sole purpose of that, that information request was to have the algorithm uh, uh, go through its thing, uh, assuming it was in fact doing so to treat a patient. Right. Um, where where it, it and and you know as you might imagine, the that FDA approval is not something that that the majority uh, of folks that we've talked to have, uh, which doesn't mean that it's it, you know that they can't leverage any of the interoperability networks. At least in my opinion, it just becomes then. A question of of how in the workflow details are they uh, interacting with uh, the, the, a human being who's overseeing them and or taking the algorithm's recommendations and actually communicating them to a patient. But there's there's a lot of really interesting policy nuance in there 
that that I'm sure OCR is 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 not particularly looking forward to parsing, but it's probably something that they'll they'll end up having to do. Yeah, I mean, there there definitely were times as a regulator when I would get a question that would that would be, would it be a HIPAA violation if it were just software accessing the data? And then what comes out is the, you know, is an output, like a recommendation, but not any of the PHI. So therefore, like there was no PHI. It was like, but you used PHI in the algorithm to create the result. And HIPAA doesn't just apply to disclosures. It applies to the actual use of data too. So, so if, you know, if you're sort of thinking, oh, this interoperability thing means I'm going to get a lot more data in my institution, more than what I just generate myself. I'm going to get, I should be getting complete data on all my patients. It's going to enhance my records. I'm going to be able to treat my patients better. Oh, and by the way, I can get in on this, you know, algorithm development gig because I'm going to have a much richer data set. You still have to have a, your use of that data to train your algorithm, to develop and train your algorithm. You have to figure out which HIPAA permission does that fall into, or you're going to have to go get the authorization of the patient. I don't think this is exclusive to health IT. I think, right, the government is looking at this everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, they're looking For at sure. how algorithms are made, how algorithms are used to make decisions, anything relating to a consumer. But because we're so early in this evolution, I think they're still figuring it out. You know, I mean, I think we're we're inevitably going to see people coloring outside the lines and then the lines are going to be, you know, clarified and made sharper. And I think in this early era of the application of, of AI in healthcare, it, it's going to be a little bit of the Wild West. I mean, we've seen a lot of this in the media, people saying, whoa, whoa, we're moving too fast. You know, let's slow down and really, you know, give this some time. You know, was it Google that said, you know, wait six months before you do anything? And uh, well, I don't think our quit. industry is going to wait. Yeah, he did quit. The quit, the, the guy quit. So so something that's interesting, just like where we started this conversation, like hymns, AI, and then Devin just went deep. Like I was reading just this week that there was a, uh, the CEO of OpenAI, he was at a, a an event at MIT and he kind of made this big sweeping statement that the like error of gigantic AI models like ChatGPT is coming to an end and that like the next thing is going to be, you know, essentially how can people take new creative ideas and use what's like available today with large language models. And I thought that was like very interesting because I feel like it, it's like most people, if you talk to them about what's happening in the AI space, like the average American doesn't know, but all of a sudden there's been this big like excitement around things like ChatGPT. And then all of a sudden you see all the big tech firms like pushing out all of their AI products that maybe have been on the back burner for a while, but then they had to kind of release things into the market to say, no, 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 we're working on this. We're doing stuff. Um, and I, you know, some of the things that uh, were, were said for why he feels like the large language models era is maybe coming to an end right now is that there was a lot of growth between 2019 to 2023, but that growth is no longer sustainable and that there's going to be some diminishing returns. There's going to be limits and there's going to be a cost element. So I think the moment that we're kind of entering to is like, okay, if we just had this huge growth period, what are the creative ideas people are going to use, which is our specialty, right? In healthcare. Um, so I think it's important to think about it in that context. And I think something that I was reading about and thinking about was also access to data. Like we, in our podcast, talk a lot about the democratization of access to data, but yet in the regular AI world, people are saying, no, 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 you can't have our data anymore to feed your algorithms. There needs to be reciprocity. There needs to be payment. There needs to be a lot of things. So I think we're going to see the same thing in the healthcare space where people are like, no, 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 no. You can't access this large amounts of data to do what you want to do. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops. But that was reading that recently. I was like, oh, I'm shocked. I didn't think that somebody who's literally on the precipice of changing the world would say, no, no, we're pausing. Things aren't going to be, they're not growing at exp exponential rate as they were before. You just made me think of something. Bulk okay. fire API. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go to that. Segway. Bulk fire API. Well, get all I the data you need from, uh, from hundreds of thousands, hundreds of patients, maybe even hundreds of thousands of patients. Let me read on your parade. <laughs> 
you fearing it? Do it. <laughs> so I've talked about this privately with you guys, but I recently downloaded the whole list of all the e certified EHR vendors from Chapel. And then my team and I has mapped, my team and I have mapped um, all the uh, vendors to the products to their avail available developer docs. So far, besides from the top 10 vendors, these buyer APIs are not ready for market. The uh, Most of the vendors certified and said that their APIs were ready. And this is the patient access APIs. We're also looking at some of the other APIs they're offering. We are exactly where we were in the payer market in the summer of 2021. It is going to take um, brute force to get these APIs to market right now. So I'm interested to see what happens with bulk fire. Where does that, is that gonna be substantially utilized or people like, we don't know right now from a patient access perspective, the APIs for the 200 plus products on the market are not ready. They certified that they are, but they are not ready for uh, real-time use. And so the question is, what does bulk fire look like? Is that gonna be ready? And this came up a lot in the information working block, information working, information blocking work groups that the three of us sat in about like, what are you exposing through those bulk fire APIs? I don't think a lot of people know what's gonna be exposed through those fire APIs. I think we should talk about that and talk about, are they actually gonna be useful in their first round? Because the patient access ones, they need a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, I think there were, or that the, there there was some some policymaker support for bulk fire that that drove it forward in some circles that that I think was predicated on this conceptual notion that 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 I essentially want to to be able to run SQL queries on your database and yeah. and I'm going to do that by by virtue of of these these fire based queries and and I think that's obviously going to be viewed problematically by those who are being asked to 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 put all of the the system processing and 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 everything into that that response. So it will be interesting to see how. But first of all, to I agree with you, Jen, how ready they are, and, and secondly, is anyone actually going to to be willing to adopt them and move forward with them? Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. Where I mean, I'm pro fire. Like that's it has been the most sexual, successful. Agree. Success, I can't speak today, successful thing <laughs> that I have been able to utilize in building one record. But I also know that there, even though it's supposed to be available, doesn't mean it always works. Well, right. And we can separate, you know, fire as a tool is a wonderful thing from all the, the policies and, and, and actual deployments of it, which obviously vary in quality from the, the very good to the not so good. So bulk fire, let's talk about that, Devin. What are your thoughts? Well, I I mean, I only I only raised it because in thinking about like the opportunities that might come, the the, the sort of business opportunities that I that a lot of participants in our interoperability world might be thinking of with respect to development and deployment and marketing of care algorithms, financial algorithms public health algorithms, like the more data, potentially the better it will work. Like let's leverage some of these interoperability tools to enhance our data and let's not do it one patient at a time. Let's, let's do it, you know, through, through bulk. And I think it just underscores to the extent that I I've always thought that anti-competitive concerns are the biggest snag in interoperability like it doesn't matter how well you can get the fire APIs to work if nobody turns them on or enables them in their system because it creates competitive um, concerns for them, then we would have spent a lot of time deploying a technology that nobody wants to use because they consider it to be a threat. So like the things that I think about for bulk fire, the things that people are going to use it for is health data analytics, um, mm -hmm. it for healthcare research, population health. Mm -hmm. I say health information exchange, but I don't mean it in like the traditional like HIE capacity, like a like the shiny in New York or Manifest Medics. I mean more like in the exchange of data at the right. top level. So just want to clear that up for our podcast listeners. I think there's some other use cases for it that people are talking about, but like those are the things that I think about right now. It's just a question: of, Are these APIs ready? Yeah, you know, for public health, we should, you know, hopefully be able to leverage bulk fire, I would think. 
Yeah, and, and I agree. I mean, there, there are use cases like, like public health where it, it's going to be considerably less controversial now that we still need to consider the the way that it's deployed and obviously system implementations need to make sense from a, a, a technical uh, scalability and efficiency standpoint. But but that that seems like a, a, a good use case for it. You know, you came to the discussion of bulk fire and from our discussion of AI. And one of the things that, that I've been impressed with in talking with AI experts is this notion that you don't really need a lot of data to train an AI model. That, that my intuitive sense was like, the more data, the better, right? If you have millions of you know, individuals worth of data that you could provide, you could train a model to do a better job than if you just had a few hundred or a few thousand. And I gather from AI experts that that's not really true, that they, that they rather quickly see an asymptote in terms of the value of larger data sets for model training. Do you guys have any, any experience with that? I don't, but the but the fairness issue comes into play, right? So any one particular healthcare system, depending on the system, may not have kind of full US population representation in their data set. So even if they could develop an, it, it, something with a thousand of their own patients, they may not actually develop an algorithm that works as well as it should against populations who were underrepresented in that data pool. Um, so if you think about like, you know, at one point, and I could be totally off about this, but I think at one point, um, you know, some of the uh, healthcare systems like Kaiser Group Health Plan of Washington tended to skew um, whiter and wealthier because those insurance options were more expensive in general. That may not be true today, but at one point it was. They have a lot of data. Presumably they wouldn't necessarily need data from anybody else to start internally developing algorithms, but they may not actually be algorithms that work very well in populations that are underrepresented in their data. So yeah, you may not need, you know, huge amounts, but but you know, there's a anything more than one person at a time is arguably a bulk fire query, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I don't fully understand how this stuff works, but. Yeah. You know, there's well, and, and you don't necessarily, oh, go sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Okay, um, I was just gonna say, there's a flip side to what you were saying, Devin. I think we all think about, gee, you want a model that is generalizable, you know, that is not, that is going to be equitable, that could be applied across populations. And that's been where a lot of the challenges have come up historically. Um, by the same token, you want a model that's going to work in the population of interest, right? I mean, if I train a model to work in Florida, it may not work well in Alaska because the patients really are different. So sure. There's but I'm just talking about from an economic opportunity standpoint, if your algorithm only works on certain subpopulations, it's going to impact the market for your, for your tool. Yeah, That's all. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and there's, I mean, yeah, where I was going to jump in there was actually to make a similar point to, to your Stephen, but also getting at, at your point, Devin, there, there certainly are some folks who are, they're, they're coming to, to market with an AI algorithm that they wish to sell. That, that certainly is a use case that's out there. Um, we actually more frequently today are, are encountering folks who just in general are, are looking to leverage as part of their operations more and more AI and machine learning. And, and there, to Stephen's point, it, it, it really is uh, their own patient population that they're targeting. They're not trying to sell their algorithm to others or generalize the results per se. In fact, they're trying to make it very targeted to their specific patient population. So, um, you know, there, there's there's that consideration there. I, I do agree with you in general, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're certainly not the first people to talk about this issue, but but as with, with any other uh, implementation of, of something along these lines, we do need to make sure that the training populations for generalized algorithms that are in fact designed to be be pointed at the, the total U.S. population, for example, are, are actually trained with appropriate data sets that don't, don't skew towards any one, one group. You know, if AI really takes off in healthcare and there is really access to healthcare data, the consumer space in healthcare could really like explode. That's just my personal thought. Like you could really build 
cool experiences for consumers going forward. That 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 that's what I see that is going to be interesting. That really makes healthcare better because it actually moves towards the consumers of healthcare. I mumbled that word as well. Can't speak on a Friday, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I, I think that would be cool to see if it can actually work outside of clinical settings as well. So Jennifer, what I think you're saying is that there will be more AI tools that consumers can access directly and do not require and the intermediary provided by a clinician or a clinical. Yeah, like I think about, think about the direct consumer lab market, labs tests that you could get that you do not need a prescription from a provider, like Everly Well and things like that. Um, think about when you could start building out consumer experiences that don't need a provider in the loop. Maybe it's more of navigation, things of that sort. Like that's going to be really cool when that gets to that point, because well, it, it takes out a lot of the friction of healthcare. That's really hard. Like I have an ear infection right now and I really want to go see a doctor, but I know I'm going to have to go to a primary care physician before I get to go to the specialist. And I really just want to go to the specialist. I don't want to go to the primary care physician. I'm old enough to know my ears hurt. They're clogged. <laughs> You know, it, it, we, there was recently published an article that was fascinating that looked at uh, patient queries of providers looking for basic medical advice. And they submitted the queries to an AI algorithm and they submitted them to a panel of doctors. And then they had people judge which responses were more compassionate, more complete, more understandable. And the bots won. I mean, they they totally <laughs> went out over the providers providing the medical advice. That's pretty remarkable, you know. And and there again, it sort of goes back to our question: Is that treatment? Is that HIPAA covered? You know, what if you just have a medical advice bot that, that does that? And 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 now we have data to suggest they do it at least as well, if not better, than physicians themselves. I think it could be navigation. It's that no practice of medicine clause, right? Like everybody has that in their T's and C's. Yeah, like. We have that in our TSCs. There's a fine line of where you're making recommendations versus you're just serving up information. Well, and again, you're definitely straying into different FDA territory if what you're doing is actually giving people data with, with, with an expectation or an expectation that you should assume, even if you try to disclaim in a way in your T's and C's. <laughs> that people could actually use that data and basically treat themselves. I think we need to finish the data liberation in healthcare before we yeah. can make suggestions or, or predict the future of AI. It's still, it's closer, closer than when I first met all of you, but I wouldn't say it's up to par. But does well, it, it does actually, it, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Donna. Well, I was going to say, does it make, does it add to some of the um, opposition that we've experienced from some in the healthcare provider community, not Dr. Steven here, but some who have concerns that patients will take their data and just try to treat themselves, cancel their visits because they go to Dr. Google and find, you know, that, you know, that that this is all fine. There's pushback around patient access that has to do with some of some of it is of course, legitimate concerns that people will do the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. will, will take an action that will actually hurt them. But I think at the margins of that is also, I lose revenue when someone doesn't come and do a visit with me, whether it's a televisit or an in-person visit and decides to just go in a different direction. It just, I'm not arguing. I mean, believe me, Jennifer, I'm on your side. Like this is what we're building for, but it does, it does create that kind of, we're, we're moving cheese here. If yes. you want to have a capitalistic market and our healthcare is capitalistic, then you can't complain about losing consumers, customers, because of what, wh however they're choosing to make their buying decisions. Then we need to move to a single payer and single health system. So like you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's just not going to work anymore. And there's too many Americans and not enough doctors. Bottom line. I, yeah, I was I was debating in my mind whether to to raise that 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 point I, because I agree with Devin that that is a consideration that's out there whether consciously or subconsciously. Um, at the same time, to her point about moving cheese, we're we're really trying to fundamentally do some restructuring of of how healthcare is delivered into a more consumer 
driven, liberated, uh, rational model, honestly, where to your point about, about an ear infection, yes, we wanna have antibiotic stewardship, but at the same time, do we really need the expensive bazooka of the US healthcare system when, when we know what fly swatter is, it is that we need in order to solve this problem? Can we just use the, the dang fly swatter? The, the, there's some of that that I think we need to, to address at, at a number of levels and, and the IT and the data flows are, are only a part of it, albeit a necessary part. Like when you go to Europe, you you can go up into a pharmacy and they can give you what you need. We have CVSs and Walgreens on every corner. It's like, why aren't we empowering our pharmacists, right? Like there are so many things that don't need providers and maybe AI will help those pharmacists. I don't know, but there's so many things that are so frustrating about well, healthcare. Remember in those other countries where you can get it at the pharmacy, their outcomes are better and their costs are lower. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just- what are we protecting here? I think we need to open up more residencies. We need more people who can provide care in different kinds of settings. And I think that coming back to the AI thing, I'm excited to see what AI does. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I've been using chat GPT a lot recently and it has made my life <laughs> a lot easier. And I don't have to spend hours doing a task. I'm like, hmm, help me with this. Thank you, moved on. It's improving the quality of my life. There you go. I, I, improving the quality of lives everywhere, chat GPT. Um, <laughs> so so th this will be a fun transition, but speaking of the, the capitalistic US healthcare system, uh, and also speaking of AI a little bit, uh, Stephen, you recently published an article on, on AI in the specific use case of prior authorization. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on how you see that use case? Well, as we were saying, there are all kinds of workflows in healthcare that are very burdensome you know, and very inefficient. And prior authorization is clearly one of those, you know, where we spend inordinate amount of resource mm -hmm. and time and inconvenience uh, in order to presumably optimize our use of resources. And what we know is we're not doing a good job of it at all. And, and it's a complex process that involves a lot of data exchange, a lot of human capital. And the, the premise of the article that I that I helped to write was really that, that we should probably look seriously at allowing AI to do prior off, that it would probably do it faster and cheaper and potentially better than, uh, than the current human-based system uh, and, uh, and perhaps much more conveniently as well. So interestingly, since, that article was a few years in the making. Uh, it came, it was the brainchild of, of one of my colleagues uh, at uh, the, on the high tech, Les Leonard. And, uh, and you know, we, we worked it up for a while. And, and since he came up with the basic ideas, uh, a lot has happened in that space. And there actually are vendors now leveraging AI to support prior authorization. It's very interesting. You know, I've learned about some of them recently, you know, and they, they're not doing the whole thing soup to nuts. They're sort of taking it apart in pieces. But I think it's a great example of where AI, you know, we were talking about AI potentially contributing to treatment. But really, I think when you talk about the payment and the healthcare operations and the op opportunities that we have to drive waste uh, and delays out of the system, I think that's a, it's a great example of where we could do that within prior off. Yeah, very cool. Uh, you know, I think anyone who has, has gone through a prior off process and they they can be be very stressful to, depending on on the the circumstances we'd look at that and and, and maybe see a double-edged sword where yes if it's if it's faster and I like the outcome then wonderful uh you just made my period of stress uh, a, a lot a lot shorter but if it's faster to reject this treatment that I need uh, obviously that's a very different thought and I think people would have in the back of their minds wow uh, you know, is, is that algorithm going to do as good a job? Is it going to make a compassionate decision? Is it going to uh, recognize the nuances of my case? All these things that, that go through your mind as you might be processing that information. Well, I'll just say that that? Part, of, part of the model that we were promulgating did very much include human governance over these, the AI use for that use case. Uh, to assure that it was doing at least as well as, as humans would do for that situation. 
Yeah, and, and I, I'm not just sure if that was Jen or Devin. You were you were starting to break in there as well. I said I don't know if sometimes humans are that good at being the being able to assess the situation as well. We have our own flaws. It, well, and actually that that had occurred to me even as I was 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 listening to Stephen's answer that it it probably just goes both ways. There are some yeah. some sometimes where. A, a, an, an unbiased algorithm may in fact provide a better outcome or and bias may not even be the issue. It may just be you know, that the person had a bad day and missed that line in your medical record, whereas the, the algorithm is going to find it. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it, I could see it, it, it going in both directions. And you know, personally, I, I think it makes, it makes a lot of sense to consider with, with appropriate human governance, especially in the early days, to, to, to look at, at uh, AI for prior auth. All right. Um, so speaking of prior auth, we, uh, we talked uh, last month about the ONC NPRM that addressed prior auth and info blocking and, and certification updates. But uh, we all, as we, we kind of looked at each other and admitted that none of us had actually read the rule. Uh, with with a little bit more time under our belts, any any further thoughts on uh, that uh, policy proposal out of ONC? I'll jump the whole in. Of the, the whole of the rule, or just the um. The well, yeah, sure, we can open it up to to any thoughts, but well, they don't have to be about prior auth. Oh, prior. We're talking about the health data technology and interoperability certification program updates and algorithm transparency. And that, that one, yes, that one. Yes, yeah. yeah. one as they call it. Okay, good. We're all. Oh, no, Jennifer, Sorry, she I, just like I, I rattled it right it off. The, <laughs> didn't get it the whole mouthful there, but but yes. I think but, the algorithm transparency is, you know, again, it relates to what we've been discussing with AI. You know, really a focus on making sure that people know you know, when algorithms are playing a role in their care and where, how those algorithms came to be, what was used in their training, how they're being used by, by an organization. Uh, I was part of a discussion earlier today with ONC about, you know, how much of that transparency should be available to the patients themselves, you know, to know about the algorithms that are being used in their care, you know, whether those are AI-based algorithms or just, you know, basic decision support algorithms that we've had for a long time. Uh, there hasn't been much of a focus in informing patients of the fact that, that algorithms are used in care. And uh, so I think I think the transparency piece in the rule is very exciting, and and it is it's a great sign that ONC has been thinking about this moment, you know, because as we said that we've really seen this acceleration of the discussion of the use of algorithms, and I think this rule is going to help us to know just what's going on with that as we move forward. There's a there's a reporting recommendation in the rule that I think is interesting. So it basically wants to start measuring how consumer, like who's accessing data, but how consumers access their data and like through what vehicle. And I kind of mentioned this earlier. I think that this is, it's interesting, but right now, you know, from a reporting perspective, I think the numbers are gonna be super low because, um, you know, there's still a lot of data that doesn't have a patient access API in front of it. So. And I've already experienced a lot of providers kind of saying, well, we can't enable your app right now, but you can have your user or patient or member reach out to us and they can get their data through the HIM department or through um, their patient portal. And so that goes back to obviously the info blocking exceptions. I find I think that it's going to be interesting to see if this does become a rule and how this plays out is like, when does that reporting period start? Um, and then what are they tying it to? Because I assuming they're tying it to future incentive payments, right? Like you, a way to push people to really not just the, the stick of information blocking, but the carrot of reward. That's how I interpreted that. I could be wrong. In this case, the reporting, I think, really has to do with the certified health IT products and what they need to do to maintain their certification. They need to do this reporting. So it's it's a little separate from what you were saying. Yeah, but I like like I said, there's a ton of EHR vendors who say they've certified for the G10 updates and they don't have production ready. And then a lot of the times 
I, I, I think for the smaller vendors, like, are they going to really have, it depends. It, it depends on the organization, right? But um, I do not see the providers and the EHR vendors linking arms right now to assess the success of those patient access APIs. It's very much like I built this for my customers. I hope they adopt it and it's on them if they don't adopt it or enable consumers. So then the, the, if, the, if the customer, the provider isn't enabling an app or the API at this point, then the reporting numbers are gonna be inaccurate on the EHR side. It's, 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 I think it's on both sides of the coin. Or it should be, and maybe that's a perfect comment to submit actually is, I mean, I don't know where ONC's authority would be to collect that information from the providers, but um, but the, I don't I don't know how many of you guys are um, saw the Twitter conversation that ePatient Dave had launched when he was seeking his information um, from a medical center in the city of Boston, and he wanted to get it through the API, and they basically held up the infeasibility hand and said, yeah. we, we won't be able to do this for you. Um, which suggests that they haven't deployed, they either have got a less than stellar functioning API from their vendor, or they are just deciding not to deploy it for some reason. There are tons that are deciding not to deploy. I've had many conversations with many providers who have decided not to deploy. And a lot of it has to do with where they are in their upgrade cycle. Mm. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating. And because there's no enforcement right now, which that means that there's no way to enforce the providers on info blocking. It, it's just this gray area. Um, I also find it really depends on how you contact the health system, the answer you're going to get. So if you're slotted through the medical records department, you're just going to get the wrong answer. You got to get to the IT department. If you can't get to the IT department, the medical records department and the patient portal are not aligned with the IT department because the IT department is closer to the EHR and closer to compliance and regulatory. So if a consumer comes through medical records or patient portal, low success. That that And that's just me doing it manually and kind of seeing a, a theme. Yeah. That doesn't were, surprise me. You were talking about um, compliance with information blocking. Uh, it's it's worth noting that we we are anticipating out of ONC later this year another NPRM specifically around the provider penalties for for information blocking. And, what do we think uh, that's going to look like? Excuse me. What do you think it's going to look like? Well, I don't know. I, I've been trying to uh, get on the docket with the guys who are writing it, uh, guys and gals, a and uh, I think you know I've I've heard a number of people musing, as as Devin knows well, when people are busy in the rulemaking cycle, they they don't let that but much out of the bag. Uh, yeah. But there are certainly a number of ways that they could go uh, in terms of disincentives for providers. But I think we are gonna have an NPRM out, uh, I heard recently by September, at least that's what it says in, in the uh, online. Uh, and I think that the team at ONC is committed to actually getting something out this year. Uh, the the high-tech folks have told us that there is going to be a high-tech task force that will uh, collect feedback on that, you know, again, in parallel with the public comment process. So I anticipate that by the end of first quarter of next year, we're actually going to have operational disincentives and penalties for providers for information blocking. Oh, man. Really, have you, know, you never been part of the regulatory sausage making? <laughs> You well, think a proposed rule on a controversial topic like that is going to get finalized by Q1? He's I, like, would, I hoped from your mouth to God's ears, but <laughs> think about hard. how long it took them to finalize the information blocking rules. It was at least two years. And but those were just the substantive rules. There, right? This has been out there for a mm -hmm. long time. And that proposed rule was out for two years. And OIG's rule, which was frankly just a procedural rule for the penalties for um, HIEs and certified health information technology vendors, which for, for frankly, the penalties were already written in stone, largely a procedural proposed rule. It's been more than two years and not final yet. In fact, if they drag this out until this summer, it will be three years. Well, I'm not a betting man, but I'm I'm hoping that we see something. I, I would absolutely love to be proven wrong. But those wheels move slowly, even when you have a totally motivated agency within HHS, which we do, for sure. I have no doubt 
that ONC wants to hit those timelines, hit them hard, get it done, but they don't get to make those decisions by themselves. And there'll be lots of phone calls coming in to the administration about how awful this is and how burdensome it is and don't, you know, too many unfunded mandates and lots of, you know, the drag that was created that we almost lost the, in the information blocking rules in terms of the patient access piece because of all the controversy and the, and the drag on finalizing that. I think you can expect a similar bit of drag and frankly, even potentially efforts to get Congress to overturn it. Can I ask you a question? I've been having a lot I hope of- not, but I'm just saying. We are in for, we thought the ride was rough getting here. Drap a, you know, buckle up people. It's going to get way bumpier Uh-oh. before it gets smooth. <laughs> Have I moved to FinTech? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I wish I could disagree with you, Devin, but but unfortunately I I don't. Um yeah, it it it's I think you know just the the even the 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 on the record public comments and dispositioning all of those is going to end up taking uh, a long time such that I think Q1 is probably not going to be on the table and and to your point the the on the record public comments are going to be the least of it in terms of people calling their their congressman and calling the white house and, and AMA, so, you name it yeah and they ha all of them right they're all providers yeah. so very important to support onc in these efforts of course because they're they are swimming up a up upstream a bit yeah um, yeah and and actually to that point we we kind of we waxed cynical there for a second but but for everyone who is is saying well hang on a second how can i can i make sure that's not the outcome um the the way to make sure that that's not the outcome is you also call your congressman call the white house if you happen to have that sort of access uh but, but certainly provide public comments uh and and frankly it can't hurt to call your congressman uh, because there, there likely is going to be some consideration, if not new legislation. Certainly, there will be questions asked in oversight hearings uh, about what is going on with with information blocking. Why are we putting burdens on providers and 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 that sort of thing? Well, and and oh, I just had to see now, Jennifer. I'm I've got your ear infection. Just like came through the ether. <laughs> Again, support. Underscore a thousand times, like supporting ONC, but also thinking through like what will make a fair rule, right? Like, mm-hmm. and yeah. and and continuing to support ONC's request to be able to do advisory opinions, right? There should be sort of a connect connectedness to those proposals because you know, understandably, a lot of fear of of providers is that they're going to get caught with some sort of penalty in from a reimbursement standpoint for for something that they didn't even realize was information blocking, right? That that runs, at, you know, un, that's the undercurrent um, behind a lot of these, uh, a lot of this. And so the more guidance that's out there that gives people some comfort that some of the things that they do that they think are reasonable are just fine. And there's some of the things that they do that they thought were reasonable, not so reasonable, more clear swim lanes around behavior is good for everybody because none of us want someone to, to, you know, be facing re- a reimbursement um, reduction for something that, um, you know, they didn't even and and legitimately didn't realize was problematic um, based on the guidance that was out to date. I happen to think regulators don't tend to go in the direction of, they, they look for low hanging fruit, people who just, you know, kind of ignored what they should have been looking looking yeah. for because that's going to be easier from an enforcement perspective but but of course we want we we need to as a community make sure that the the rule is fair has due process considerations and that we also support funding for ONC to continue to be a transparent organization with respect to the expectations yeah yeah absolutely and 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 it, obviously there's 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 multiple there's multiple sides to to every one of these and 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 that does none of us any good to have a rule that causes provider organizations to go into a bunker mentality of of trying to make sure that they're you know complying with the rule and and taking lots of conservative steps that end up 
uh, it, making them less open in general, which I, I suspect could very easily be the case, despite that seeming counterintuitive in a discussion of information blocking or information sharing. Uh, but, but yeah, a, a fair rule that actually accomplishes the policy objectives, you know, so simple. What, what? <laughs> um, so along somewhat similar lines, uh, Jen, you had mentioned uh, uh, having some thoughts around uh, some safe harbor and, and patient issues. Uh, did you want to uh, uh, raise that topic? Yeah, so I think it's in the rule, but it suggests a safe harbor for those who participate in TEFCA. Not quite a safe harbor. Not quite. It's really what is it? Hard. Explain it to me for the layman. <laughs> It's complicated, but basically, okay, no. <laughs> yeah. basically, if you've got two parties and they're both involved in TEFCA, and one of those parties, they, they both signed up to be part of the TEFCA exchange, which we know is voluntary initially. If one of those parties asks for access to data using a non-TEFCA method, the other party can say, no, I'm going to give it to you via TEFCA. And that that will be acceptable. So if you've got two parties that are both signed up for TEFCA, you know, either either one of them can say, I want this via TEFCA exchange, and that's going to stick. Okay. So what is the party? Well, again, you've got a data requester and you've got a data holder. So those are the parties. But what if it is? So this is where I think I have an issue with it is like, is it provider to provider exchange? Is it provider to- It's payer? all of it. It's so, all of it for any permitted purpose under TEFCA. Okay, right. so provider to consumer exchange, that's what I worry about because that means that um, it, I think it derails the open developer ecosystem a little bit. So my understanding, and I could still have this wrong, is that the consumer is not considered a participant under TEFCA. So, so this was clarified in our meeting this week. But an IAS provider would be. Right, you so were in that app, meeting, Devin. <laughs> yeah. An app that has signed up to provide IAS services and wants to plug into the TEFCA in order to facilitate access would be subject to what Stephen just said. Okay, so let, let, one record, Care Quality Commonwealth Live. We'll pick our future q in someday. Everybody bring me some great presentations on why I should pick you. Um, but the, so let's say that I'm connecting to providers and payers via their, and HIEs via their uh, fire APIs or whether API they stand up in the HIE world. And but I'm you've also- joined TEFCA. You've signed, you're doing TEFCA. I'm participating in TEFCA and I want to get data. So this is where I think the breakdown is. Open developer ecosystem is free. One record will always have a free app to consumers because that is my promise, as long as I'm allowed to do it, to always offer free. And so that right now a consumer can sign up, get their data for free. Now, let's say I join a QHIN and I have my I, I have my identity proofing vendor, whether it's clear, ID.me, one cosmos, LexisNexis. I'm trying to think of all of them, but you know all of you. And then I'm participating in TEFCA and they say, no, you, you don't get this API anymore. We want you to just do it here. So now there's fees onto the consumer that could potentially, we might have to pass it down to, on the consumer app, we might have to pass it down. I just don't like it. I think it undermines the open developer ecosystem, which I think needs to be protected because it's in such an early form right now. And TEFCA is in such an early form right now. So that that's where I have issues is wherever you create an opportunity for interpretation to get out of something, it makes it a bigger fight for me. Now, that, that, that makes sense. The, the challenge is that ONC and HHS generally are really looking for opportunities to incentivize the use of TEFCA. And this, this was the next one that they came up with. Yeah, but we already have enough problems with IAS in the TEFCA landscape. It just, I, I think it's a good, it's a good idea, but it could have some ramifications that haven't been thought out. And I've historically always seen this. It's always easier to think about the provider or payer workflows before you think about the consumer workflows. And a lot of times the consumer workflows don't get the same consideration of a covered entity workflow. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Well, this is a good opportunity to put in a plug for public comment. 
So the, the ONC's HTI-1 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking is open for public comment today at this time. And this is a great time for you and everybody else to put in any kind of public comment you want. You don't have to read the entire thing. You don't have to understand the entire thing. You can just go after, you know, I, I heard Elise Anthony say it, say it today on a call, that you can just give them one sentence and that's a public comment and they will read it. Mm -hmm. Wait, I have a follow-up to my comment. That was a great plug. Is that, so I think about this from a workflow perspective, right? So let's say I have a certain amount of providers participating in TEFCA and if it could, and then the, we have to push them through that identity proofing workflow to get data from there because now those providers say we're no longer going to support open access. But then for all those other 200 plus products that aren't participating in TEFCA, then I have to push them through this workflow. It creates this disjointed consumer experience, which is where my issue has always been because I've already been experiencing this. So I just think it isn't fully thought out. And those are my opinions today. Well, I mean, I hear you with respect to how you design a, a consumer experience around three different authentication methods. Yes. Uh, that's that's something right. that will will challenge the best UI designer for sure. Um, <laughs> but 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 you know it's it's I, unfortunately I don't have have a solution for it either. Uh, you know as we're in the transition space uh, between getting to where I think ultimately what we want to be with some sort of of more unified validation approach, whether that's via somebody like Clear or, you know, there's there's some equivalent of sign in with Google that that works in in this uh, in this ecosystem. There is going to be a transition period where there you're going to need to to handle it, you being anybody who's in this space is going to need to handle multiple authentication methods. Um, that feels like an odd point to end on. Uh, I'd point you back to to Stephen's plug for for putting in public comments uh, for sure. And uh, with that, uh, thank you so much to our panel as always. And uh, we will close out for this episode. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.